<laughs> and we're live guys welcome to it's another episode of good morning crypto only here only on ivan on tech we are of course broadcasting live straight out of stockholm sweden and we do this show each and every day at 8 a.m central european summertime guys i come to you like an atomic clock each and every day today we have a very important episode because today we will be discussing the current bull upwards movement we're seeing which is of course amazing this industry really needed this at this at this moment and i want to congratulate everyone in crypto right now also it's important to note that all coins are performing surprisingly good in fact you could say that all coins really started this move upwards and many of the old coins such as cosmos for example are really really pushing in a very very good manner upwards so we're going to discuss what is really happening and why things are looking quite bullish for bitcoin as a whole remember it's not only about day-to-day -day swings upwards or downwards it's also about the bigger picture so i do have some interesting news to you uh, to, uh, for you today about the hash rate which is insanely insanely big i mean we've grown so much since the last bull market since the last time we were at the uh, the all-time highs of course of 20,000 also we're going to discuss an article on Bloomberg where they basically discuss why Bitcoin is needed right now with the current political climate around the world with the current issues we're seeing with the fed and also the repo frenzy you know that we have been discussing the repo frenzy for a few days now but today i also have some numbers for you basically exactly how much the fed is printing in order to support repo markets so it's just only only a small subset of the things they are supporting the repo market basically overnight lending that banks do with each other but now they cannot really do it because there is no liquidity nobody wants to do this repo uh, agreements and fed has to Stop, step in as the last resort buyer and we do see now numbers exactly how many billions they are printing every day to support this small small subset of the things they are they are uh, they are being the last buyer off and also we're going to discuss a very important news in regards to tether and bitfinex unfortunately tether is this cloud on our skies that never goes away and there's always some kind of new issue with tether with bitfinex and of course we do see the investigation by attorney general in new york we do see cftc going after them as well but now we also have a new class action lawsuit against tether and i actually have the lawsuit here on my screen and we will read it together i will show you the most important parts in that lawsuit basically they accuse bitfinex and they accuse tether of manipulating the markets and and uh, and and really using it to their advantage creating tethers that are not backed by anything pumping up the prices creating the biggest bubble in human history as the lawsuit uh, suggests and then using it to their advantage so guys we have a lot to discuss i want to welcome everyone in this chat let me know if you're feeling good today i do think that everyone is feeling good today because the markets are green i want to welcome max x dope 82 Ivo, Garo, Fallo, Chris, Cardano, Green, Bernard, Crypto, Yoda, Rocket, Fuel, everyone, very, very welcome to the show, as always, smash the like, as always, smash the bell, also, let me know where you're from, and please, be active in the community, be active in the chat, let me know if you agree with the things we discuss, with my opinions, or you disagree, be active and interact with other people in the community, don't be a lurker in the dark, as we always say on this channel, because there are many lurkers in the chat also i have a very fun news namely i'm gonna be interviewing kim.com you all know kim.com from mega upload i mean this guy became very very famous approximately seven years ago seven eight years ago when he had issues with uh, the u.s government because they took down mega upload they raided his home in new zealand and he's still fighting that battle so on Thursday, October the 10th, we're going to interview him live. So you can go and set reminders already if you check in the in the description. I mean, this is going to be completely epic because I myself remember that I used Mega Upload sometimes when I was a kid. I mean, <laughs> it feels like everyone used Mega Upload. And you know that Mega Upload was actually one of the biggest websites on the internet. It had like 4% of the entire internet traffic once upon a time. So this is going to be very, very interesting. And it is on Thursday you can find it in the description already now 
Looking at the markets, we have a following situation. Bitcoin up 4.4%, almost 4.5. Ethereum up 5.9. Ripple XRP 5.2, very good. I mean, Ripple has really been performing well the past uh, the past weeks. Uh, you cannot really say anything against that. Then Bitcoin Cash at 5%, Litecoin 5%. So very, very solid gains, 5%-ish um, in the top uh, top 10. Looking at the top gainers, uh, well, we do have the usual suspects. I mean, <laughs> the usual suspects, ABBC and Energy. And then, of course, Cosmos. I mean, really, I treat these two coins as outliers because they really have some interesting things going on in their market making, I guess, because they're always extremely volatile. They're always at the top of the gainers or losers. So I just treat them as outliers. It's like every day you see them. But I think the most important uh, movement right now is, for example, in Cosmos or for example in quant because these platforms i mean many of them have been developing their technology for quite some time and um, they did not really get a lot of light and a lot of shine in the last bull market i mean we did not really see for example cosmos being discussed a lot um, when cardano was discussed a lot or when eos was discussed a lot in 2017 and early 2018 so there are a lot of these projects that i think do have interesting technology but that the market has totally missed completely so it's good to see them moving up as well. Now, the big losers, who do we have? Um, I mean, no, no, no real losers, guys. What is this? I wouldn't call it losers at all. We do have a stable coin losing half a percent. <laughs> DAI also losing half a percent. So quite interesting that we do have stable coins moving a bit down. But this is kind of... The thing when everything else pumps, there is supply and demand, stablecoin versus crypto. And they, I mean, although they are over a dollar, many of them. So yeah, nothing really has happened on the downside. An important thing to keep in mind right now, when we are bullish, when people are finally turning bullish in their minds and really people just follow the prices. That, that is the thing. Not many people actually do any long-term strategy. They just go with the flow, so to speak. When the prices are down, they become negative. When the prices are up, they become positive. So this is why I do this every each and every day almost to really combat this mindset because you know that when the prices are down you get so much more negativity in the markets you just look at Twitter you just look at social media everyone is extremely extremely negative and now that the markets are up now everyone is happy because people are really you know their emotions are being affected by this a lot and that is why most people also lose money because their emotions basically guide their decisions but an important thing to highlight really when we are in crypto and when we are in Bitcoin is that Bitcoin is really creating a whole new social upper class. I really had this thought yesterday that I, that I found very interesting. So basically what we do see is number one, the biggest transfer of wealth maybe in the entire human history that is going on right now. And um, it is for a simple reason because the entire economical system is being disrupted. And it's only one of the aspects because the second aspect is the fact that Bitcoiners and people in crypto know more than 99% of the population when it comes to economy. I mean, people are so interested about how fiat works, how Fed works, how much money is being printed, how it really works in the economy. And these people are in crypto. I mean, most of these people are in crypto in one way or another. So you get this very, very powerful combination. The fact that we do see people being extremely educated about maybe the most important things in life, which is economy. You don't learn it at school, but it it really affects and guides your everyday life, how your economy is doing and how the macroeconomy is doing. And at the same time, we also do see this natural transfer of wealth because it is a disruptive new industry. So, you know, I thought this was extremely, extremely interesting. And if you agree, go follow me on Twitter and also retweet this. You can find it at the top of the comment. And it is one of these things that we need to be keeping in mind when we're looking at the bigger picture. It's not only about day-to-day -day, uh, swings in human psychology and swings in the markets. And you also see very good fundamentals being stronger, stronger, and stronger. And I think rhythm expressed it in a very good way. Rhythm is a, a, is a very popular account that I think you should follow on Twitter as well. Basically, he's writing, he or she, not really sure which gender, but they are writing the fact that Bitcoin's hash rate is now 7x larger than it was during prices all-time high of 20,000 in 2017. So you look at the people who are really, really in crypto and who really depend on crypto as their daily income, as their living, I mean, it, it is the miners. 
The miners rely on cryptocurrencies and on Bitcoin more than anyone. The miners are incentivized to keep this industry afloat more than anyone. So miners are really key to this industry. And the sentiment, the sentiment of miners is very important because how miners see the future obviously affects how much they're going to mine. And when we do see the hash rate increasing as it does, miners are really looking at capturing as many Bitcoin as possible before the next halving. And this is, I think, why we do see this increase that is pretty, pretty significant. And the price in many cases also follows hash rate. I mean, we have been discussing it a bit, but, you know, the natural explanation is that hash rate should follow price. When price increase, then people want to mine, people want to make money, and then the hash rate follows. But it is only in the short term. People who do that only think in the short term. Miners who think in the long term and they really believe in crypto, they don't care if they are unprofitable for one year or two years or maybe even three years because the long game is that now is really maybe the last few years you have to mine as much Bitcoin as possible before the difficulty goes through the roof because even more people will join and also the block reward will go down by uh, by 50% next year and then by 50% again in four years and then again by 50% in yet another four years. So all in all, it is really, you have just a few years left. So this is why when you look at fundamentals of Bitcoin, hash rate is such an important thing because here are people who are really, really long-term thinkers. They're really long-term planners and they don't care that they are losing money in one or two years because it's all about accumulating as much as possible. So when mining happens at a loss, which it does in many cases today, it is actually a good sign for the future and it really shows you confidence in how people are viewing the market and those people are of course the miners and they have so much incentives to be in this space. I want to share with you this uh, Bloomberg article also basically confessions of uh, uh, of a reformed crypto doubter basically this guy jared right here he was not a fan of crypto but now he is now he is he has turned by educating himself but before we go there i want to show you this basically these are the uh, the numbers for the repo operations that the fed is performing right now this is something that we been discussing for a few days. I mean, basically, you remember we discussed the fact that the repo rates went uh, to 10% in September, which is insane because the repo rates are basically the interest rates bank or banks are paying to each other when they do overnight loans. So if I'm a bank, you're a bank, I might give you a bond, you give me cash. And the bond is basically your security that I will pay back you the cash tomorrow. So this is in order to get liquidity into the banking space. Banks needs, need to do this now and then in order to be and stay liquid. Uh, so these repo agreements, and of course, it's, repo stands for repurchase, um, uh, or, uh, repurchase agreement. And it's all about the fact that basically I give you a bond, you give me cash, and then in the morning we switch back and I, and I give you the cash, you give me back the bond. And, you know, they have been seen as very secure for a very long time. And it was insane that the interest rate really went to 10% because the, these loans are extremely secure. You get a bond, which is should, you know, at least should be seen as a very safe security. And now the Fed is stepping in, stepping in, stepping in as the last resort buyer, buyer of last resort. And here is how much they are printing per day, basically, per day. So on a day-to-day -day basis, you can see that, you know, on Monday the 10th, um, let's see, on the 10th, um, uh, that we do see right here with uh, 75 billion. Then on Tuesday, which is, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, this is the month. I mean, man, in the US, you switch the date format is a bit strange. This is the Monday the 7th, Monday the 7th, because here is the day and here's the month. Yes, see, in Europe, we do not do days like this. In Europe, the first number is the is the day, then the month, then the year. But in the US, they work a bit differently. So yeah, this is Monday the 7th, which is uh, 75 billion that is being injected into the economy. Tuesday the 8th, which is today, we do see uh, 45 billion. To, uh, and then you do see Thursday the 10th is going to be 45. All in all, this is only a small project, so to speak, that they're doing. This repurchasing support of uh, of repo markets is only like a side thing they're doing, but you see how big numbers we're dealing with at the end of the day. You do see how big numbers uh, we're dealing with, and it only underlines how brittle this whole 
space is. I mean, how brittle the space of uh, fiat is right now. Because it's not even their biggest business. It's like not even the biggest thing they're doing. <laughs> it's only a small, small, minor thing that they have to do in order to support the, uh, the repo markets in particular. And this is how much money is being printed. So now coming back to the Bloomberg article, basically what Jared is writing here is that, you know, at the end of the day, it is very important that we do have stateless currencies. And this topic is big, is big guys. It's extremely big. The fact that at the end of the day, it's really time to enter this space of stateless currencies. Just like religion is no longer part of the government, which it was for centuries in the past, the same thing will happen with the currencies. Because at the end of the day, all leaders want to be seen in a good light. All leaders want to be these shiny stars that are helping their population. And, you know, it's all about two things. Number one, bread. Number two, circus. You know, you need to give people bread and entertainment. And then they, they don't need to care about how that really is provided. So I thought this was very interesting in this uh, Bloomberg article that they wrote about the fact that, hey, look at the current uh, century sentiment when it comes to elections. People are promising so many things. So for example, we are early in the 2020 presidential campaign. The types of things we're talking about, student loan forgiveness, medical debt forgiveness, Medicare for all, a wealth tax, um, uh, would require bond issuance that might not easily be absorbed by the capital market. So basically, the state will have to raise a lot of money to really fund all of this. And also, we have to understand the fact that uh, the relationship between the president right now and the Fed is is becoming quite unusual for for past presidents. So you know that Trump has been harassing, as they write here, they, he has been harassing the Fed. He wants the Fed to do as as he wishes. So for example, the fact that they should decrease the interest rate. This is something that he has been pushing for a very long time and really ridiculing Fed on Twitter. And so what they write here as well is that it is not unreasonable to conclude that his successor will do the same, maybe even eliminate the institution institution altogether. I mean, obviously the Fed. Now, I don't know if it will go as, as long as that, but at the end of the day, you realize that it is in, in, some, in some cases, you could make the argument that it would be in the interest of the president to not have Fed, to be in full control of monetary policy. Now, whether it will go this far or not, who knows, but we are living in interesting times where the old status quo is changing in all kinds of different ways. So maybe in the future, it might be the case that we do have a Fed-less economy. And while it might sound amazing to everyone who is really looking at the Fed, we also need to realize that in reality, it might be 10 times worse because now the, the leader can do what, what he or she wishes with the monetary supply. And now that we don't even have any gold backing, we don't have any gold standard, you realize that if it is the case that the leaders who are here only four years at a time and they get to decide the monetary policy, it becomes very scary. So basically, here is what Bloomberg writes that, hey, wait until you see what happens when there is no Fed, which at least, which at least makes some pretense at maintaining purchasing power. And what will happen if only politicians have control over, over monetary policy? So all in all, I think these are very interesting times and Obviously, all of this is extremely, extremely bullish for Bitcoin. I don't think I've ever been as positive towards this industry as a whole. And I mean, while it is amazing to look at day-to-day -day price fluctuations as today, the big movements are, of course, the changes when it comes to the traditional banking space and traditional fiat space that we're seeing right now. It is all a big experiment. Bitcoin is also a big experiment, but let's not deny that the other spaces are also very, very experimental and it's not really clear exactly how it's going to play out. And at the same time, you do see great fundamentals in Bitcoin itself with increasing hash rate, with increasing community, with increasing activity in the markets. So it is, of course, amazing, amazing to see.
Now, the next topic will be about Tether, because one of the biggest clouds on our sky is, of course, Tether. I mean, yet even today, we've been through this so many times, but even today we do see uh, a new uh, class action lawsuit coming in, basically accusing Tether of all kinds of things. And these are the same lawyers that did the, that, that uh, really fought the case against Craig Wright. And you know that they won. These lawyers won the case against Craig Wright. And now they have shifted to Bitfinex and Tether. So that will be the next, the next uh, topic. But first I want to look at the chat. What is happening in the chat, guys? Crypto's Chain is saying, good morning, Ivan. I'm a bit late today. What do you think about McAfee Dex? I have an intro with John McAfee. Nice. Look, McAfee Dex, I haven't checked out it too much, to be honest with you. <laughs> but but I think it's funny because, you know, McAfee Dex, th there was someone who posted this picture of McAfee antivirus, basically blocking McAfee Dex, saying that it is super dangerous to visit. But <laughs> I, I, to be honest with you, I haven't tried it. I haven't tried it, but also I don't think it's even launched, right? They're launching it right right now or or in in, in a few days or something. So I, I will be looking forward to that and great that you have him on the channel. Okay, moving on, moving on, guys. The next topic is, of course, about this cl uh, class action lawsuit. And as the block writes, these are the same people who have won against Craig Wright. And these are Fel Friedman, Kyle Roche. I mean, th these are the guys who filed the suit. And uh, they are the lawyers who successfully sued Craig Wright in Florida. And it, this was just recently. This was just recently. So here is what this uh, uh, lawsuit is all about. Basically, the writing that it's all about part fraud, part pump and dump, and part money laundering. And th the whole scheme uh, was created by Bitfinex and Tether. And it's also all about the fact that uh, they claim that tethers are backed one-to-one -one by dollars, then they change their narrative and now they say that they are backed by reserves, but reserves can be uh, loans, it can be debt, it can be obligations, it can be really whatever, but now a tether is saying that they are backed by reserves, whatever that means. And this lawsuit claims that this is false. I mean, this th this claims that the Tether is backed, that, you know, uh, that the number of USD tokens in circulation will always equate to the dollars in his bank account. The lawsuit claims that it is a lie, and the fact that uh, they're saying this cannot be backed. We did not see any third-party audit. And also they're saying that Tether issued extraordinary amounts of unbacked USDT to manipulate cryptocurrency prices because the market believed the lie that one USDT equaled one US dollar, Bitfinex and Tether had the power to and did manipulate the market to an unprecedented scale to profit from the boom and bust cycle they created. So this is very important. This is extremely important. Because at the end of the day, you realize that if you are in control of these operations, if it is the case that Tether really did this and they really could Print. I mean, obviously they could, but whether they really did it and use it to their advantage, this would be extremely, extremely big for the entire space. And this is something that many people have been speculating about and many people have been suspicious and they, many people have been suspecting that it is the, the case. So it's going to be interesting to follow this lawsuit because at the end of the day, they're going to go to the bottom of this. Just like they went to the bottom of the Craig Wright story, they will go to the bottom of this story as well. So in one way, I think it is very good for the crypto space to find finally see this play out and to finally see this uh, really reach some kind of conclusion. So they continue that from 2017 through 2018, Tether printed 2.8 billion USDT and used it to flood Bitfinex exchange and purchase other cryptocurrencies. This artificially inflated demand for cryptocurrencies caused the prices to spike. And then as cryptocurrency market reached a new fever pitch, Tether's mass issuance of USDT created the largest bubble in human history. <laughs> I, I thought this was interesting, that they went so far saying that it was the largest bubble if in human history. Maybe in terms of uh, percentages, I mean, how much it increased, uh, but not in terms of how many people were affected. I mean, we cannot say that it was the large, largest bubble when it comes to number of people affected. But as you can see on the chart, 
Yes, it is the case that uh, in percentages, how many times the price has increased compared to the starting price, how much the price has appreciated, then you do see that, yes, Bitcoin is bigger than Mississippi bubble, bigger than Tulip bubble, uh, bigger than South Sea bubble and Nasdaq composite. So you see here, just as a comparison, when it comes to uh, all of these bubbles, that Nasdaq is like the small green chart at the bottom. So all in all, they continue to describe why they think that this is uh, this is an issue. And at the end of the day, they say that calculating damages at this stage is premature. But there is little doubt that the scale of harm wrought by defendants is unprecedented. Is What is this word? Wrought. I've never seen this, guys. I've never seen this. But this is the thing with crypto. You read papers you would never read before. So I'm reading this lawsuit. I would never read this lawsuit before. So yeah, wrought by the defendants is unprecedented. So at the end of the day, they say that their liability to the putative class likely surpasses 1.4 trillion US dollars. So I'm not really sure how they calculated it, but they claim that it's all about the fact that uh, they has they have caused this harm to the entire market, to everyone involved in the market, and this harm can be compared to 1.4 trillion. I think they do have a number somewhere here, basically talking about that 450 billion were evaporated from the market. Uh, let's see if we can find it somewhere. Yeah, I don't want to, to spend too much time searching here, but they basically said that, hey, when everything collapsed, basically we had 400 plus billion being completely erased from the market as a whole. And now they're saying 1.4 billion in total damages. And so I don't know how they really arrived at that number, but now we do see some interesting developments in Tether. And obviously, if Tether really if they are liable for this, if they get some kind of uh, um, of uh, of result from from this lawsuit that is putting Tether in danger, it's not good for anyone. Like, it's not good for anyone holding crypto if Tether really, really collapses because uh, because of this. And also, I think at the end of the day, it's also all about money. It's all about money and how good lawyers you have. And uh, it is comparable to the SEC situation with block one, which I want to cover after I read this comment. Baron, morning, Ivan, what is your opinion on blocks route? Uh, man, I have to check it out. Uh, I haven't checked out blocks route, but uh, the thing with crypto is that there are thousands of these projects. There are thousands and thousands of these projects and products to try. So for me to try everything is, is quite impossible, but yes, I will check it out if you are interested. Blocks route, cool. Now, I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about the lawyers. I mean, the, the article that describes the situation with Bitfinex makes a very, very clear case that it's all about the fact that the same lawyers who won against Craig Wright are also doing this class action lawsuit against Bitfinex. And I think it is clearly demonstrated by Block One and their SEC struggle and really how lightly they have um, evaded disaster with from the SEC by having good lawyers. So uh, this is another article by Coindex. They basically describe the fact that, you know, Block One raised $4 billion dollars in their ICO. The SEC concluded that at the end of the day, it wasn't done completely right. It wasn't done completely according to the rules. But their their fee they have to pay to the SEC, basically the penalty is only $24 million, which is only 0.6%. I mean, this is only 0.6% of ICO's uh, race. So basically they got a free pass. <laughs> they got a free pass on this. And also you do see Catherine Wu and Catherine Wu, he, she comments a lot of things on Twitter and she is basically a legal commentator. So she has commented this whole case and how it really played out and basically the ruling and how EOS really um, handled it, how Block One really handled it. And her conclusion was also that, hey, at the end of the day, it's all about the lawyers. It's all about that they have such great lawyers. She even, she even wrote this, you know, uh, man, their lawyers are good and uh, they have evaded disaster by really, really paying the, the, their lawyers a lot of money and they have been successful in that. So I think a similar thing could happen to Tether. Like at the end of the day, it's all about the funds you have and the justice is not on um, 
is not something that uh, that is equal for everyone unfortunately in our age so we're gonna see we're gonna see guys but for the be you know the best solution for the market would be that the usdt situation doesn't collapse instantly because obviously so many people hold tether and so many people also tr trade and transact with tether in their everyday business i mean believe it or not in asia this is like standard <laughs> to do business in tether it's not bitcoin they're doing business in. it is tether it is stable coins so while i think we do need transparency while i do think we need to see what's really going on and it would be great to really go to the bottom i'm also a bit worried for the markets as a whole Okay, uh, Vincent Breslin is saying, please introduce Dan Larimer on EOS 2.0 upgrade. Yeah, that would be cool. Actually, I think I can do that. I think I, I have great connection with Block One. I have great connection with them. Um, and uh, I, I think it would be possible to, to discuss that. Uh, but I, so we discussed recently the latest upgrades with, for example, uh, web standards for authentication. We discussed web assembly and web authen, and we discussed cryptography on iPhones, things like that. So yeah, I have a shirt that says my lawyer can beat up your lawyer. <laughs> right, right, right. Yes, it is. It is how the world works. Why does nobody mention Dan Larimer's, uh, perverted past? Uh, I have no clue about it to be honest with you i have no clue really dan larimer first i learned about him when i saw this uh, this uh, post on bitcoin talk basically satoshi said that hey if you don't understand blockchain i have no if you don't understand bitcoin i don't have any time to explain it to you so i think he wrote it to dan larimer but then of course steam it bit shares uh, he he created a lot of projects that were used by many people i mean steam it even today is used by quite many people. It is maybe the biggest dApp out there that is being used by, by you know, people who don't have any clue about how blockchain really works and really about this whole financial aspect of the blockchain. But at the same time, Steemit had a lot of issues. And then, of course, EOS came around and now he is he's basically a an OG in the space. You, you can say that. The most virulent commentators are those who want a job in crypto companies and a good pay. Virulent. You, you, do you mean violent or virulent? I, I think about virus or something. Uh, so you, do you mean that they want a job in crypto in crypto companies and a good pay? All right. I mean, uh, yes, to get a, a good job, you probably need to be seen online. So that is true if, if that is what you mean. Stop insuring people who are not creating decentralization in this space. I mean, you you t take any coin, even Bitcoin, you will have 10 people saying something similar about any coin. So I think it's useless discussion, to be honest, because you pick any, I mean, even Bitcoin is not liked by anyone. So by everyone. So, so just, uh, it's just a, a simple fact of life. But for me, I'm interested in, in technology. I'm interested in the economy. I'm interested in learning about different projects. So I, I don't have any, any issues interviewing EOS or Cardano. I do think they are extremely interesting. So, so that is, that is how that is. LOL vocabulary day. Exactly. Exactly. Man, vocabulary. And by the way, go check out my first videos on YouTube. You will see huge progress on vocabulary. Vocabulary. You know, I, I, I don't even know how I could, you know, think that I would do YouTube with my English in the early days. <laughs> it's really amazing. It's really amazing. But, you know, when I started YouTube, one of my... One of my motivations was that, hey, I'm not doing this to become big, but I'm doing it to just improve English. And I think it was a very good uh, mindset because if you think that you will become big on YouTube and that is your motivation, it will be difficult. It will be difficult because it might take years before you become anything on YouTube. So for me, it was, okay, I do videos every day and I improve my English. That's it. What else? Uh, thank you, Ivan. What do you think about Ravencoin? Uh, I, you know, I think it's interesting and because one of my friends here in Stockholm loves Ravencoin. So he has been talking about Ravencoin like crazy. And uh, the fact that you, you should be able to issue securities and like tokens on it and so on and so forth. My impression of it is that they are quite... Um, uh, quite decentralized when it comes to the community. It's not, uh, it's it basically they try to mimic Bitcoin a lot and uh, they have a good decentralized community. But all in all, Ravencoin is one of these coins that unfortunately doesn't get a lot of, um, a lot of attention. I mean, how are they even doing? 
Raven coin. Yeah, I, this bird. <laughs> bird coin. They're 37. I mean, it's quite good. Out of thousands, they are 37. So it's quite good. Uh, they had a pump in, in early 2019. And since then, it's only been dumping. But yes, uh, I, I think they are interesting. But to be honest with you, there are so many other coins basically doing kind of the same thing so <laughs> but it's nice to see the community i mean i think what they have that not many other projects have is the community because i do know you know my friend here in sweden then there is another guy i know who likes ravencoin as well so all in all and in, in different countries and it's, it's so random you know suddenly they start, start talking about ravencoin and uh, it's not like ravencoin is some kind of hyped coin really if you if you at the end of the day it's not it's not a cryptocurrency that is being discussed in the broader crypto circles but still i meet so many people who are involved in this and just randomly they start talking about it so seems that the community is is strong raven is strong because of bitrix yeah, yeah probably hello ivan what do you think about hedera uh, hydrograph looks like uh, it is the future it's centralized but look so many things are centralized in our space <laughs> so i guess it's not very different uh are there any coins generating revenue or are they just future promises? So, I mean, many coins generate revenue. It's all about staking. If you stake coins, they generate you revenue. You're part of the block production and then you're also part of inflation. But there is no, I mean, when you think about it in terms of a stock, if you have a stock, you actually produce value and you sell goods and services that people pay for, and then you get a dividend for that. So it's not like that. In crypto, it's more that you get a coin, you can stake it, and then you can basically produce more coins by providing security to the network. So you can think that you're providing a service, which is security, and then you get a dividend for that. But it's not like in, in stocks where you do have a whole organization doing something for, for their customers. Um, I mean, in many ways, maybe you can say that about Binance coin. Binance coin is all about how far Binance can expand their empire and what kind of uh, services they can build. And as you can see in the bear market, they have been performing quite well. And I think it's so interesting to see that, uh, you know, in 2017, they were at 21 and now they are at uh, 33. So it's maybe one of the coins that has really shown how things are done in this space, even in the bear market. Uh, but yes, I mean, this is not about being a decentralized currency. It's all about Binance pushing and uh, and uh, being more useful to in the crypto space. Um, what else, what else? Ivan, what do you think of Link? No clue, no clue, man. Um, uh, uh, Glacier Protocol. Uh, Ivan, what do you think about... Yeah, so so the, I, IOTA, I think we did a video on it. Uh, let, let, me, let me show it to you. Ivan on Tech IOTA 2019. So the recent things that are interesting with IOTA is this. Like Core Decide, uh, the fact that... Um, they have finally come up with some kind of a solution to their to their uh, centralization problem. We discussed the solution here in great detail. You can check it out. If you just Google, you know, IOTA 2019, you will find it. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's all theoretical. So this needs to be put in practice. Uh, Ivan, how do you have... Oh, thanks. Th thanks, Valdemar. Well, I, I bought the screens. I bought the screens, then we painted the 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 wall black. If you look at my older videos, I did not have a black wall. But uh, now it is better with the black wall because it's kind of, you know, smooth transition between the screens. And, you know, the reason why I got the screens is because one of my greatest motivations was Grant Cardone. I mean, <laughs> this is when I still was in school, like... I had no money, I was just wondering what I should do with life, what I should do in business. So I found this guy and I followed him for quite some time. Uh, and he has screens, so... <laughs> so th that's why I also thought that, hey, I gotta get screens. I gotta be like Mr. G, Uncle G. So that that's why. What are your top three coins at the moment? Uh, I mean... People always want me to tell them some kind of exotic coin, but to be honest with you, my top three coins are quite boring. So number one, Bitcoin. I mean, obviously, obviously Bitcoin. Number two, Ethereum. Number three, I mean, this one is a bit more difficult. Here, my, my number three switches. I mean, for a long time, it's been EOS. And still, I think it's interesting, but they do have a lot of drama right now with their block producers. And uh, by the way, I will have a video from Korea uh, about this whole drama. And they have changed the constitution. So, I mean, I understand why they're doing things they're doing, but like the 
it's it's not looking good right now for, uh, when it comes to the their main consensus layer. So. All in all, uh, EOS has been at fork quite some time, but uh, my number three is switching. Like, uh, we'll see what it will be. But still, uh, you, you, we're, I'm gonna release this video, I think this this week, we're gonna, we, you're gonna see it. But basically there is an issue with uh, the Chinese basically taking over the, <laughs> the entire network because they have the most, the most EOS. And it is kind of like Bitcoin in 2013, 14, we did ha have this debate about Chinese miners and uh, the issue is that they're not really uh, there is a communication barrier there there is a cultural barrier and so it's a bit difficult to cooperate in, in that fashion so i think it's just a question of time because right now nobody is talking about bitcoin having this chinese minor problem anymore so i think it might be the case that a similar thing will be in eos as well but my number three is changing like i don't want to give you any clear answer because all in all none of them are you know quite uh, solid to be honest with you it's like it is it is something to be seen still but i mean the more solid ones are bitcoin and ethereum i'm sorry not to to surprise you with some kind of random exotic coin like i know many people want me to say something like you know oh i like x max or something so <laughs> <laughs> so that is how that is guys that is how that is but you know lately i'm following for example cosmos i wouldn't say that it's my like top three but um, lately i have been following cosmos and it's been for the last year approximately that i've been following their development and mainly because i met very smart people in uh, los angeles when i was there last time and they were into Cosmos like crazy. And this was, by the way, before they got listed on these, you know, big exchanges. I think they are even on Coinbase nowadays, Cosmos. But don't quote me on that. But I do think that Coinbase has Cosmos. So it was interesting to follow their development. Uh, yeah, I, I do think they have Cosmos, right? Atom. Yes, yes. Probably, probably, or no. Yeah, don't quote me on that. But anyway, uh, and, and so one of the biggest things we do see in crypto right now is DeFi. So that is, by the way, why I, I, I'm saying to you that uh, Ethereum is a very important project. I mean, don't listen. I, I don't agree with Bitcoin maxis that say that it is a scam. It, you know, it doesn't have any interesting use cases. DeFi is maybe the biggest use case we do see in crypto right now outside of, you know, digital, transparent, worldwide payments and digital gold. It is DeFi. And then number three, we'll see. We'll see. I, I, I'm keeping a look on the market and... Um, uh, and 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 monitoring it monitoring it for interesting projects but let me know what your what your number three is yeah exactly abb <laughs> abbc let me know your top three guys let's share now that i've shared let, let's share as well yes cosmos is good I, I do think they're good well engine could be but engine to, for me is a bit too narrow to be my top three like and look i think engine is fantastic but it for now it's still too narrow for me for my taste, too narrow. It's uh, it's basically gaming and, and these collectibles, which is good. I mean, I like them a lot. We do have a whole course on engine, how to develop these games with engine. You can go to academy.ivontech.com to learn. But to really be put as top three, I think it's a bit too early. And also because I, ne I need more base layer platforms. Like I I'm more interested in base layer platforms. And I think that engine is a platform. I mean, it's not a DAP, it's a platform from games, but it's just too narrow. And um, I, I think there will be a time where narrow use cases will be uh, big, but for now it's all about just fixing the base technology, fixing the base protocols, and then we can be more narrow. But all in all, look, I mean, we've seen so many coins come and go, and uh, look at Chainlink, for example, it's a, it's a clear example. It's also a bit too narrow for me. I do think they're interesting, but also a bit too narrow because it's basically about uh, oracles. So while it is key component of the entire space, a bit too narrow for me as well. And in the next bull market, I do think that this top 20 will look so different. It is already looking quite different because, I mean, this Bitfinex coin was not here just, you know, six months ago. Chainlink was not here in the top 20 six months ago. Obviously, Bitcoin SV was not here uh, six months ago. Or when did they get released? Maybe it was six months ago. But you get the idea. They were not here in the last bull run. So I think the times are changing. And you see, for example, Neo. I mean, these guys were huge in the past, absolutely huge in the past. And uh, they are not really seen that much lately, unfortunately. MM Crypto, shout out, shout out, shout out to MM Crypto. 
Okay, guys, more more questions. Yeah, so here we get top three BTC F Nash. So I know Nash recently launched, but uh, have you used it? Like, ha have you used the exchange? Because uh, I've heard mixed mixed reviews on Nash. Let's see, Nash ex and Next. I I've heard mixed reviews, uh, but uh, all in all, we did see a small pump and then yeah, the downwards. So let me know if you've actually used it, and. Uh, Write in the comment section if you have. Uh, what is the next B cash fork? Uh, I, I don't know, man. I, I don't think forking Bitcoin is that profitable nowadays. To be honest with you, some some of these forks really, really made the killing. You look at uh, Bitcoin Cash, obviously Bitcoin SV, but even you know the surprising thing is that Bitcoin Diamond, like Bitcoin Gold, is thirty eight. What the hell? <laughs> I mean, who is trading this? I, I think this is fascinating. It's fascinating and it really shows you like the brand Bitcoin. You can really do whatever you want. As long as it's called Bitcoin, somebody will buy it. Also, Bitcoin Diamond, I think, yeah, 53. It's it's really mind-blowing. Algorand is 54. I mean, so, I mean, the market cap of Bitcoin Diamond and Bitcoin Gold is bigger than Algorand. And these guys have been so hyped during the past year with, uh, with the Turing Award uh, uh, winner which is the Silvio in their team. Uh, carrot gold, be, ca be careful with that because it is uh, it is a Ponzi at the end of the day. Uh, so yeah, I think it's very interesting, but I don't think people will be forking Bitcoin that much. I mean, we've seen so many of these forks and some of them are not really performing that well. For example, let me show you. For example, Bitcoin private. Where is Bitcoin private nowadays? Are they even here? Bitcoin private, which number? They're number a thousand, basically. So, I mean, there was a time where they were where, where they were big, and also like I I, sh I had this video long time ago, long long time ago about Bitcoin Cash. Let's see, let, let me show it to you. Bitcoin, cash, Bitcoin, Cash. Not Kawa. Yeah, this one. Bitcoin Cash Cows. This was a year ago. I basically explained the transition between different uh, ways. B between different ways people made money and look this is pre-studio i didn't have a studio back then so we have we've been through a lot we've been through a lot what are your thoughts on bdao <laughs> bdao you know bdao i mean number one the name Let, let's talk about the name for some reason i think about these asian toilets you know where they kind of flush your stuff is it i mean is it called bdao like bdao toilet is it what it's called uh, because you know, in Russian, it's called it's called something similar. You know, these toilets where you don't even have to uh, use paper; it's like water. They 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 flush you themselves. But on a more serious note, it is DeFi on Binance. DeFi um, DeFi on uh, on Binance, and I think it's very interesting. But at the end of the day, also Binance is uh, is one of these chains that is only starting. So I think it's a leap of faith that they're doing in one way. But DeFi is so huge nowadays. You look at uh, Ethereum, you look at... Uh, yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. B buy that. Be day. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> yeah, 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 be day. Okay, yeah, exactly. Uh, but anyway, I think it's very... You know, the, the space of, um, of uh, uh, DeFi is very big. And I think it's going to grow bigger. So it's good that they are trying it on, uh, on uh, Binance. But uh, it's also a leap of faith. It's a leap of faith because this whole space is so, is so new when it comes to building on top of Binance. So yes, th that is how that is. But I, I know my, my good friend Chris works at uh, BDAO. So I get, uh, I get some updates. That is why I know, uh, I know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been looking into them. I've been looking into them. Okay, guys, thank you so much for watching. Finally, finally, this is kind of... I know we have some Swedish people in the chat. It's, it's quite interesting. But if you go to Bitcoin event.se, we do have an event coming, out in, uh, coming up in Sweden. I mean, it is basically a you know, newbie event, we will be teaching, you, it's basically for people who want to learn what Bitcoin even is, how to buy it, how to store it. But if you want to meet, if you want to like be at the event, you can go to bitcoinevent.se. So check it out, bitcoinevent.se, it will be on the 30th of November. Now that I saw some Swedish people in the, in the chat. Uh, and also guys, before we run round the show up, don't forget uh, Kim.com. 
Kim.com coming to the show on Thursday. On Thursday, he's gonna be here. We're gonna be talking about Mega Upload. I mean, really, what the hell happened with him since then? Because Mega Upload was so big in 2014, 13. I mean, this whole story about them being shut down. Mega Upload also had 4% of the entire internet traffic, and obviously Kim.com was the guy who really started it, but now he, he's also in a lot of trouble because of it. So this will be on Thursday, 8 a.m., as always. But that being said, guys, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you tomorrow at 8 a.m. once again. Have a great day. Be sure to smash the like. Be sure to smash that bell as well. And have a good, good day. Enjoy your Tuesday. Really make the most out of it. Uh, out of it. And uh, goodbye, guys. Goodbye, 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 goodbye.